It's a real uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a real pleasure to come and talk about the Chinese Revolution and how we understand and have understood uh, and perhaps will come to understand the Chinese Revolution at a school where uh, is now teaching the only student of mine of those 30 odd that ever uh, ended up writing a dissertation on the Chinese Revolution. Uh, I, we trained a number of students at UCSD who wrote about a great variety of topics from the, the White Lotus Rebellion to the tours of the Tianfeng Emperor uh, to film in the Republic of China, but none of them ever wrote about the revolution. Uh, until finally Jeremy came along uh, and wrote a dissertation about the revolution in the far southern Chinese province of Hainan. Uh, and so it's particularly appropriate, it seems to me, uh, to talk uh, today uh, about uh, the Chinese revolution here uh, at uh, Cal State San Bernardino. I want to begin with uh, a young man who in many ways introduced the term revolution to China. Zhou Rong, who wrote a pamphlet in 1903 entitled The Revolutionary Army. He was, uh, at that time, uh, a mere 19 years old, a young radical from the interior province of Sichuan. Uh, any of you who've been to a Sichuan restaurant know that its food is full of hot peppers, which Mao Zedong always associated with revolution and said that's the way you make revolution, uh, is you eat a lot of hot pepper. Um, he had a traditional education, son of a virgin, and then went off to study in Japan, as many young students at that day did, uh, seeking a broader uh, understanding of the wider world. There he read a lot of Rousseau, read about George Washington and Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, and wrote this pamphlet uh, entitled uh, The Revolutionary uh, Army. Uh, it had, uh, I might note at the beginning, nothing to do with the military. Uh, the army was really the uh, army of the people uh, in a broad revolutionary uh, alliance. Um, but he was passionate uh, about uh, revolution, as we shall see. Um, he was passionate especially about the need to overthrow the then ruling uh, Manchu uh, dynasty uh, and about uh, bringing about a, a fundamental a change to China. Uh, as we saw in the uh, first uh, picture of him. Uh, he's a young man who had already cut his queue, uh, the queue, the pigtail uh, that the Manchus had imposed on the Chinese people uh, was often cut off by young radicals who uh, uh, opposed Chinese rule. Um, and uh, in uh, memoirs and recollections from the period we know that this pamphlet that he wrote was one of the most <coughs> widely read uh, and uh, most influential uh, pamphlets of the early 20th century. You can almost think of him as the sort of Thomas Paine of the Chinese Revolution. And if we look at uh, one brief uh, section from this book in translation, he writes, uh, my voice echoes from heaven to earth. I crack my temples uh, and uh, I guess I, 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 I beat my head, I changed the trench. I beat my head and yell my throat hoarse and crying out to my fellow countrymen, revolution is inevitable for China today. It is inevitable that the Manchu yoke is to be thrown off. It is inevitable that China is to be independent. It is inevitable that China is to take its place as a powerful nation on the globe. It is inevitable that China is to survive for long in the new world of the 20th century. It is inevitable that China is to be a great country of the world and play a leading role. Now, the any Manchu, what at that time was called racial revolution uh, phase of this, of course, 
uh, referred to uh, overthrowing the Manchus who had ruled China uh, since the uh, early uh, 1640s. Um, they were a uh, nomadic people from north, the Northeast. Um, you can see the early Kangxi emperor here uh, in Manchu costume with his uh, quiver full of arrows and his sword, um, exemplifying the fact that, that he was going to rule in a somewhat a different way uh, as a Manchu. Uh, and as the Manchus had a privileged uh, position in China uh, in the 19th and 20th century, they came to be much resented, and they also came to be blamed for the failures that China had encountered uh, when Western imperialism uh, came to China, subjected it to the failures of the Opium War, um, the Sino-French War, and so on and so forth. They were, in other words, uh, associated with the fall of China and blamed for it. But anti Manchuism is not uh, really uh, our concern uh, here as much. Uh, it's the other themes. Uh, if China uh, is to be independent, if China is to survive, uh, he writes. Uh, and it's, it's difficult to think uh, nowadays that anyone could think that China could actually fail to survive. Uh, at the time. But it did reflect a re very real fear uh, in uh, China uh, in that time. Uh, China had uh, just been defeated uh, in the war with Japan in 1895. It had been followed by uh, the occupation of Beijing uh, by the eight nations uh, of the international expedition uh, in uh, 1900 and the scramble uh, for uh, concessions. And you can see here uh, Queen Victoria, uh, the Kaiser, uh, French Napoleon, uh, here's the, uh, the French actually, uh, the Japanese uh, all sitting and the Chinese, of course, uh, standing in the background saying, you know, don't carve us up uh, like that. Uh, but uh, a pleading, uh, as people like Zolom would say, uh, in vain. Uh, so long in, in another case would write, what with internal anarchy and external humiliation, the country may be annihilated within a decade and, and our race within a century. Uh, and again, it's difficult to concede uh, that you actually think that the Chinese race would cease to exist, how this you know, 400 million people are going to cease to exist. But in an era uh, in which the British had occupied India and taken it as a colony, were carving up the Ottoman Empire uh, into different nation states of uh, Greece and, and uh, Bulgaria and, and so on and so forth. The idea that a great empire could actually be carved up and could cease to exist was very much part of the uh, era uh, in which people like Thoreau uh, built up. A sense of real crisis. Uh, that they were uh, living in. Um, but the other theme was that China had a rightful place as a powerful nation of the globe, uh, a great country uh, of the world playing a leading role, uh, and that China somehow needed to recover uh, that hope and, and that proper uh, position uh, in the world. He saw uh, in the early 20th century uh, a world that was driven by racial competition. Uh, and this was very much, uh, again, uh, the mood of the day, uh, the social Darwinian struggle between the right races and the other races. Uh, and in his uh, mind, there really were only two races uh, that uh, possibly could uh, emerge uh, dominant in this, the yellow race uh, and uh, the white race, uh, as you call them endowed by nature with intelligence and fighting capacity. But they are fundamentally incapable of giving way to each other. Uh, either the white race was going to win or the yellow race uh, was going to win. Uh, China, uh, he said, uh, had great potential uh, if it could just realize it through this revolution that he envisioned. China is capable of embracing the whole world of shaking and dazzling the entire globe, of surveying benignly the nations from on high and dominating the five continents. Um, 
Now this was, as I say, an immensely influential uh, pamphlet uh, of the day. Uh, and it was characterized by what also was common uh, at that time. A sense that on the one hand, China was in great peril, and on the other hand, China could be the source of great hope. Uh, that it stood at a crossroads, uh, in a sense. Uh, either it could be carved up and cease to exist, uh, or it could emerge uh, victorious, the revolutionary struggle become strong, uh, revive itself, uh, and dominate uh, the world uh, to come. So Rome's uh, own fate was unhappy. Uh, shortly after the publication of the Revolutionary Army, he was arrested uh, in uh, Shanghai. Uh, brought to trial by the mixed court in Shanghai, sentenced to two years in prison, uh, but unfortunately did not survive even that brief sentence, uh, died in prison uh, in uh, 1904. Um, but he, in many ways, uh, ushered in uh, a century of revolution for China and the Chinese people. Though he did not long survive in his pamphlet, uh, the message of revolution indeed certainly did survive. In particular, the belief that revolution is inevitable if China is to take its place as a powerful nation on the road. Uh, and that uh, belief persisted uh, throughout most of uh, the 20th century. In 1911, the revolution that he was calling for uh, finally uh, took place. Uh, and uh, Sun Yat-sen, you see here uh, in the middle, uh, together with his colleagues of the Revolutionary Alliance, uh, became the leaders of the new Republic of China uh, ushered in in 1911. Uh, but their new Republic uh, was quickly descended into warlordism and division. Uh, Sun Yat-sen himself had to yield power within a few months uh, to the most powerful the generals of North China. Uh, and the early years of the Republic were a great disappointment uh, to those who had advocated uh, revolution. Um, and soon uh, the May 4th movement uh, broke forth in 1919, uh, or the New Culture Movement, as it is often called. Uh, with a dominant theme that the 1911 revolution had failed because it had only changed the political structures of China. It had not brought about more fundamental change in the Chinese culture and in Chinese society. That the patriarchy, uh, the old thinking of Confucianism, uh, the old respect for ancestors, uh, had mired China in a backward culture that had to give way to a more forward-looking, inventive, creative uh, culture, such as that which they saw in the West. And under the slogans of a revolution for democracy and science, uh, they urged that China needed to undergo a more thoroughgoing uh, revolution, uh, that the revolution had not been complete. Uh, and that call was eventually uh, picked up uh, by Sun Yat-sen, uh, Sun Yat -sen, uh, who had led the uh, first revolutionary struggle against the Manchus, but then had uh, gone very much into the background. Uh, he came forward again in the 1920s, entered into alliance with the Chinese Communist Party, got substantial aid from the Soviet Union, both military uh, and uh, financial, and uh, launched the Northern Expedition and the National uh, Revolution uh, to deepen the revolution uh, of 1911 uh, and make it now successful in China, again, a great and powerful uh, nation. Sun's program of nationalism, democracy, and people's livelihood, uh, what we call the three people's uh, principle, uh, 
inspired a new generation of Chinese, both in the Nationalist Party and in the Young uh, Communist Party. Uh, and the idea, once again, was that a revolutionary army uh, would liberate the people from their suffering. Um, and uh, there you see uh, shackled the Chinese people uh, by the bonds of feudalism and imperialism, uh, and they're going to be liberated by the sword-carrying uh, nationalist army uh, soldier uh, who is going to release the energy of the Chinese people uh, to uh, make China a great again. But Sun Yat-sen died in 1925, <clears throat> and the National Revolution was really led not by Sun himself, but by uh, Jiang Kai-shek, Jiang Tie uh, who was a military man, uh, and as you can see uh, in this or other photographs of him, uh, a very strict, straight-laced, stern, disciplined uh, man, uh, much more committed to Confucian <coughs> virtues uh, and uh, old-style uh, discipline uh, than was uh, Sun Yat-sen. Jiang broke with the communists in 1927. Uh, and uh, the years from 1927 to 1949 were characterized by an ongoing struggle uh, between the communists and the nationalists to who would be the heirs to Sun's revolutionary manner. It's important to realize that Jiang Kai-shek himself uh, never renounced the notion of revolution. Uh, in fact, he called the communists anti-revolutionary. Uh, he was the one who was defending the true revolution. Uh, he was the one who was carrying on the true revolution. Uh, but the communists, uh, on the other hand, said he had betrayed the revolution, uh, and he had not carried it forward. Uh, he had not been thorough enough. He had not carried out the land reform that Sun Yat-sen had promised, um, and so on and so forth. Um, when uh, the Japanese invaded in 1937, uh, driving the nationalists from their coastal base uh, into the interior of China, uh, they entered a long period in which both the communists and the nationalists fought the Japanese independently, but supposedly in a united front, always in competition, uh, and always with the communists saying the nationalists had not carried through the revolution the nationalists had not made a revolution which was thorough enough. Uh, and in the end, in that contest, it was Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communist Party which uh, emerged uh, victorious uh, and uh, continued the program of deepening the revolution, uh, of pushing forward the revolution of bringing China to its great power status through one other revolutionary stage. But even Mao himself, um, after uh, some years, by the mid-1960s, became convinced that his comrades in the party uh, had forsaken the revolution, that they had become revisionist, that they were protecting the vested interest of the bureaucracy and the party. Um, and so he launched one more revolution, uh, the great proletarian cultural revolution, a revolution which was said to be now this time a revolution which would touch people's souls, uh, that it would not just change the economy. The economy had been changed. It would not just change the political system. The political system had been changed. It was not just going to change the social system, but as landlordism had been eliminated with land reform. Now it was going to change the fundamental psychology and thinking of the Chinese people themselves. Um, it took as its attack the old culture, uh, the old thinking, uh, the old ways of learning, burning books, uh, burning the uh, sculptures and the, and the figures from the old religious practices. The old China would now be wiped away uh, altogether. <laughs> and this time, uh, there had, was uh, a revolution that, that nobody could claim had not been thorough enough. Uh, this was a revolution that 
finally was clearly thorough uh, enough. And when Mao died in 1976, uh, China turned with remarkable speed away from its revolutionary uh, course. Uh, the Cultural Revolution had been waged uh, under the slogan of countering the restoration of capitalism. Uh, under Deng Xiaoping uh, and the policy of reform and opening, uh, although the official slogan was socialism with Chinese characteristics, everybody realized that what this really was was the restoration of capitalism. Uh, it was exactly what Mao had been struggling against uh, all the time. Um, it is no accident uh, that there are more billionaires in China than anywhere else in the world. Uh, it is exactly what capitalism produces. Uh, and China has done it now with a vengeance. And so the new post Mao era uh, is in many ways uh, an era uh, which has been described <coughs> as farewell to revolution. Uh, the term comes from a famous uh, book, essay, uh, written by Lisa Hull and Yuvay uh, Wu in 1995. And it discussed the 20th century history that I have just reviewed for you uh, and come to the conclusion that revolution had been a disaster for China. Uh, the idea that China would somehow become strong uh, and emerge strengthened from revolution was a fallacy, uh, they said. And China had been following that false course uh, ever since the early 20th century. It was time, they said, to bid farewell to revolution. Uh, it was time uh, in the era of reform and opening to try something else. Uh, Mao Zedong himself had constantly contrasted the approach of reform, which he condemned, to revolution, which he approved. And now the time had turned, and people said, let's not try that revolution method. Let's not try any more chaos and confusion and violence and class struggle of revolution. Let's try the course of reform. Uh, now, there is no denying the fact uh, that the real change uh, in China uh, has come uh, not with the revolution, but with the reform period. Uh, if you look at this graph, and I frankly think that there are some problems with it, but uh, in fact, I don't think it's quite going down as fast there. Um, but this is comparing GDP per capita of China and Western world uh, over you know, 2,000 years, the long time span. And you can see uh, Europe, they're dating here from around the 13th century, a slow, gradual change, and then the 19th century, a very rapid change. And China continuing on at a relatively constant pace here until suddenly you get to the 1980s and it just goes, you know, the back graph goes virtually straight up. Uh, it is in the 80s, uh, it is when China said farewell to revolution uh, that the real transformation uh, begins. Um, when I first went to China uh, in 1979-1980, uh, China was an overwhelmingly rural country, uh, still uh, you know, of the order of 80% of the population. Uh, were still uh, peasants at that time. Uh, at this time, uh, China is a majority urban uh, country. It is mostly uh, urban, uh, and peasants are now uh, the uh, minority. Um, and the China today is, needless to say, an utterly different country uh, from uh, the China of uh, 1980. Uh, what has happened between then uh, and now uh, is nothing short of spectacular. And it's important to realize that we're not just talking about the big cities uh, or 
uh, talking about uh, high-speed rail, uh, you know, which we talk about, you know, maybe 20 years from now, uh, perhaps building in California. Well, they're all over the place uh, in China and, and going uh, comfortably and speedily between all uh, the major cities. Um, but um, if we look at uh, small villages uh, or, or small towns as well, uh, if this is the China of 1980, uh, I went with a bunch of students to what were called backward counties, uh, the less developed uh, county, uh, to do uh, education programs for poor students. Um, and, uh, you know, this is one of the shops uh, in the town of a poor county. You know, you can go to Dancing with Wolves uh, and, uh, you know, a, a fancy a little boutiques like that. Uh, this was the middle school. Uh, in uh, that county. Um, so we're, it, it's important to realize that uh, although there are still poor villages in China, I don't want to deny that there's still poverty in China, it's important to realize that the change we're talking about is not just Beijing uh, and uh, Shanghai and a few big cities. Uh, it uh, continues to uh, be a, a number of second and third order cities uh, as the Chinese uh, describe them. Um, so the change between that uh, and uh, the time, this is a, uh, a popular pamphlet from the time uh, of Dolo, uh, and when China felt itself uh, oppressed by the great power, here's the Russian bear and the, in the north and the French frog and down in Vietnam in the south and uh, the British lion uh, lying over the Yangtze Valley, the United States, the, the American eagle has just taken the Philippines and, uh, and, and Here's the opium facade, a uh, Manchu official uh, sweeping it out uh, and uh, not arousing himself. Um, the change between that period uh, that Dolan was talking about uh, and today uh, is uh, literally the change of night uh, and day. But all of this leaves uh, the Chinese leadership and the Chinese Communist Party uh, profoundly ambivalent on the question of uh, revolution. Because the Chinese Communist Party, of course, came to power through revolution. It was not elected. Uh, it has never been subject to an open election in China. It cannot deny that the source of its legitimacy was its seizure of power by revolution. Uh, and despite renouncing uh, virtually all of Mao's policies, um, it's still Mao's portrait uh, that hangs uh, in Tiananmen Square. Uh, and it's still uh, Mao Zedong alone, uh, whose mausoleum uh, and whose body uh, sits in uh, Tiananmen Square. Uh, Mao remains unavoidable. Uh, Mao remains uh, part uh, of uh, the Chinese sort, party's source of legitimacy. The party claims to be the successor of that whole series of revolutions uh, that I talked about. Um, in uh, 2011, on the 100th anniversary of the 1911 revolution, uh, the party leadership, the party leader what was then Hu Jintao, uh, uh, gathered in the Great Hall of the People uh, to make uh, speeches in praise of uh, Sun Yat-sen and the, uh, the revolutionary legacy uh, of uh, Sun Yat-sen uh, and describing how the Chinese Communist Party was the true legitimate successor uh, of uh, Sun Yat-sen. Uh, and his revolutionary uh, legacy. Chinese textbooks uh, still tell uh, the conventional history of revolutionary succession uh, through 1911, 1920s, uh, the Communist Revolution, uh, and so on. Uh, the newly opened uh, National Museum, uh, which was visited by uh, the current leader, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, and, in fact, the current standing committee of the Politburo, uh, the seven guys who run China, 
um, visited by uh, Xi Jinping, praised as the proper orthodox correct view of Chinese history, which is of the Communist Party as the successor of the revolutionary history uh, that I just uh, described. On the other hand, the Chinese Communist Party, as an unelected and autocratic ruling group, is profoundly afraid of revolution. I was in China at the time of the Arab Spring, uh, and I can tell you it was extremely unsettling uh, to uh, the Chinese leadership to see somebody like Mubarak, who they thought was as uh, solid and entrenched in his power, uh, suddenly overthrown uh, in that way. Uh, the party is constantly studying the lessons of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. What went wrong in the Soviet Union? Uh, why did Gorbachev uh, allow it to break up uh, in the way that it did? Um, the lessons of the failure of the Soviet Union uh, are ones that the, the party is constantly setting. And every time there is one of these velvet revolutions or orange revolutions or perfect revolutions or something, uh, the, the party again uh, is afraid that somehow uh, this might uh, come uh, to haunt uh, them. Uh, and finally, uh, most recently, uh, the fellow who was on the far right of that uh, photo from the, uh, the National Museum, Wang uh in the standing in the Politburo, has been recommending to people that they should uh, read uh, Cookville's uh, The Ancien Regime uh, and the French Revolution. Uh, uh, that, uh, again, uh, learn the lessons of past revolution. Uh, and instead of reading Marx on the French Revolution, what you used to do, now he's reading somebody who, uh, a conservative, uh, who essentially said the revolution was a mistake, uh, and the old regime was doing quite well in its reforms, how it was that it got overthrown. They're identifying now much, much more with the old regime uh, than they are uh, with the revolution. The Communist Party, in other words, has become a governing party as much as it is a revolutionary party. Uh, and it has, as I say, that ambivalence uh, towards uh, revolution. So how are we, uh, as historians or students of history, uh, to understand uh, the place of the revolution in modern Chinese history? <coughs> and I would suggest uh, that this question is as much contested in the West as it is contested in China uh, itself. Uh, and it's important to realize, uh, as I'm sure all of you know, that history is not just a matter of a bunch of facts uh, cobbled together or lined up one after another in chronological order. Uh, but history is a matter of answering questions or solving puzzles. Uh, and in that sense, it matters absolutely what question you're asking. Uh, and what I'd like to suggest is that the question that we're asking of modern Chinese history is beginning to change. Uh, and precisely, it's beginning to change around the issue of the revolution. The old question uh, that uh, we used to ask um, was, why did China fail to change? Why was China constantly mired in poverty uh, as a country of poor, starving peasants trying to make their way uh, uh, in, in the world? Uh, why did China fail to modernize? Why did China fail to industrialize? Why did China fail to learn from the West? Uh, why did China uh, fail to become a strong regional power in modern uh, East Asia. Uh, always in these questions, the comparison was with Japan, which had industrialized, modernized, a 
become a great power, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and China, in contrast to Japan, was a failure. Uh, China had not uh, break, uh, broken out uh, from uh, its poverty and isolation and backwardness. And uh, for any who are interested in intellectual history, uh, it's important to realize that uh, this uh, whole <coughs> Uh, mindset uh, has a very ancient tradition uh, in uh, Western uh, intellectual history. Hegel thought of China as the country without history uh, because no one was free except the emperor. Uh, and so it was utterly changed. Marx, when he wrote about China, uh, wrote about the Asiatic mode of production. Um, and in contrast to Europe, which had slave society and feudal society and then capitalist society, and ultimately was to move into socialist and communist society, uh, China was fixed in an Asiatic mode of production, uh, what would elsewhere be called oriental despotism, uh, in which there was only a strong state and bureaucracy and then a mass of peasants. Uh, below. Uh, it was something that was often uh, associated with the strong state needed to build the dikes uh, to control the rivers. Uh, this is the well, Yellow River here, and they're building a great big dikes. You have to organize masses of people. It requires a great state to do that. Uh, that was one of the theories behind uh, Oriental despotism. Max Faber. Uh, in my mind, probably the greatest sociologist of all time, uh, was also fixated on this uh, problem of why did China, with such an advanced civilization, such an educated elite, uh, such a powerful government, why did it fail uh, to develop? And he fixated on uh, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism uh, in the West, as your theory, uh, and China, instead of having this strong, driving, uh, driven by a, 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 a transcendent God, uh, the belief in, in uh, one's chosen thing. China uh, always was trying to compromise uh, with other people uh, and therefore didn't have the driving creative spirit uh, of the West. Um, Joseph Needham uh, wrote an enormous, uh, you know, uh, there must be 20 odd volumes. Uh, mm -hmm. A tremendous a series on science and civilization uh, in China, uh, in which he explores the fact that so many of the great inventions of the early modern world, the compass, uh, paper, uh, printing, uh, gunpowder, uh, porcelain, uh, all of these things were invented in China. Uh, why had that not gone on to create a modern scientific revolution. Uh, why had China advanced uh, to a level that it was probably, in fact, almost unquestionably technologically uh, and economically ahead of the West, uh, probably up to the 15th century or so, uh, and then uh, began to fall behind uh, as the scientific and then the industrial revolution uh, uh, moved to the West uh, in advance. In other words, the point is here, the image in all of these views, and in the early scholarship of China, was that China had all of this potential, but it had not modernized uh, in the way that the rest had. Uh, and whether it's writing about industrialization, or writing about the last stand of Chinese conservatism, uh, the notion was somehow that the Confucian culture, uh, Confucian norms had somehow held uh, China back. Uh, and although uh, the scholarship that I'm talking about here is largely Western scholarship, it's important to realize that China's scholars through most of the 20th century had the same view, uh, that it was Confucianism that was the problem, uh, that it was the lack of scientific knowledge, that it was the lack of uh, technical curiosity. Uh, there was lack of critical thinking, a subject that some of us were talking about uh, earlier. Um, the 
these were the things that were lacking in Chinese culture that had held uh, China back. And by the middle of the 20th century, uh, these um, uh, conclusions and these views uh, had uh, been bound together with the narrative that China was backward, was uh, a country of famine and disaster, and that only a revolution, only a fundamental change of everything that had characterized the old society could possibly uh, transform. Uh, and thus, as we've seen in Fogel and the others, uh, revolution was inevitable if people would be liberated from their poverty uh, and backwards. Revolution was the only mode of change uh, for that modern China. But, again, as I just suggested a few moments ago, uh, since the change in China that we're seeing today came not so much as a result of the revolution, but came as a result of saying farewell to revolution, change between this China and this China, uh, the notion that revolution uh, is the source of change uh, is a seeming a little bit backwards and off base. Uh, the change comes uh, really when uh, China joins the WTO uh, and opens up uh, to the outside world. Uh, the final stage of the revolution, the Cultural Revolution, was, as I said, uh, against the restoration of capitalism. Uh, but it was precisely when capitalism comes to China uh, and young ladies are making the things that are on the shelves of Walmart uh, or uh, making the computers for uh, Apple or Dell or whatever. Uh, it's only in that that uh, the dramatic change uh, comes about. And so what that suggests to me is that uh, perhaps uh, we've been asking the wrong question. Uh, in asking why China failed to do this or failed to do that, uh, that seems a sort of a backward question uh, nowadays. Uh, certainly, uh, as I teach uh, students uh, nowadays, the idea that China is backward, uh, that China is undeveloped, uh, that's not the China they're hearing about. That's not the China uh, that they know. Um, the narrative that uh, in order to uh, overcome obstructions, you had to do revolution doesn't seem to make such sense. Uh, it's really when you did something else. So, uh, if China is now uh, modernizing at an unprecedented uh, rate, uh, it's, it's certainly no longer a failure. And we certainly shouldn't just be asking why China failed. Uh, we shouldn't spend a lot of time uh, understanding that. What we need to understand is, in fact, why China has become so successful uh, in uh, recent years. So we get new questions, uh, and new questions are going to require a new history, uh, a new narrative. Uh, they're going to give us uh, a new uh, story. Now, if you uh, read the press uh, or the conventional wisdom that I think you're most likely to get, uh, you'll get a story that, well, China was backward because it was doing all this revolution stuff for all that time and following this foolish old Mao for a long time. And then it finally woke up and opened up to the outside world. And it started learning from the West. It let businessmen in from Hong Kong and Taiwan. Uh, and they opened these factories. And they taught it how to be good capitalists uh, and learn the technology of the modern world and the business ethics of the modern world. And in general, China is progressing, become, is becoming more like us. Uh, that it's learning from us. Uh, and that's the way uh, it's uh, moving ahead. Um, but I would like to suggest that that's not the case. Uh, that 
China is not becoming more like us, and that China's success is not uh, the result of uh, its becoming uh, more like us. Um, and in many ways, uh, I think a critical turning point uh, is precisely the year 2008 uh, and the enormous success of the Beijing uh, Olympics uh, and the great burst of pride uh, that all Chinese experience uh, at the great success of their uh, Olympics games. And the way I'd like to suggest the, the impact of this is in this way. When I first went to China in the 1980s, it was very common for people to be really taken with the modernization narrative that we have to become more like the West in order to advance. Um, and after 19, uh, 2008, uh, I think one was not hearing that story uh, much uh, at all. Um, not only did China suffer uh, experience, um, a uh, wonderfully uh, successful Olympics, um, but it came at the same time that uh, the Western world uh, was uh, dominated by headlines like this, jobs, stock quality, market declines, layoffs, panics, downturn, recession, and so on. China was on the rise, and the West was falling apart. Uh, mired in a recession, uh, which the Chinese devised a number of very successful economic measures to get through with relatively little uh, damage uh, at all. In addition, there, so uh, on the one hand, the, the Chinese at this point began to say, you know, it's not that the West has all the even their economy is not running anywhere near uh, as well as ours. But there's a similar conversation going on about politics. Again, through the 80s and 90s, uh, early 2000s when I was in China, I don't know how many conversations I would have with Chinese friends and colleagues uh, who would say, you know, the problem with our system is that there's no check on the Communist Party. And so there's no check on the kind of corruption, uh, the kind of abuse of power, uh, the kind of pollution that they can bring on the people without any consequences. The problem with China is there's no check on the Communist Party. You in the West, on the other hand, have a two-party system, a multiple-party system. If one party doesn't behave, you can uh, vote it out and vote it into the other party. And, and I would have to say that since 2008, I haven't ever had a conversation with the Chinese in which they said the two-party system is such a great thing. Our two-party system looks like this. You know, it's your fault, not your fault. Uh, and you know, you get the two together, and they look like that. Uh, <laughs> the, the two-party system uh, in the United States, uh, certainly, has utterly broken down. Uh, it's become a, a recipe for total stasis uh, and inability to do anything uh, about the nation problem. Um, and again, in terms of China, it is literally true. I have not had a conversation in the past four years in which people and Chinese have said, you know, the problem with the Communist Party is that it doesn't have a check on it. We need a two-party system. They're not thinking that way at all. Uh, your way, our way, I'm not saying that they're all satisfied with their current system, but they're definitely saying, we're not going to try and adopt your system to make things better. Uh, we're going to have to find a way to do it better on our own that's going to be a Chinese way of resolving these sorts uh, of problems. The um, uh, charts 
of what's going on uh, in the world today. Uh, this is Chinese and U.S. Uh, GDP as a, uh, a, a portion of uh, the global uh, total. Um, and uh, the, the, the um, trends are, are, are clear. Frankly, I think uh, China ought to be red. But anyway, you can see China is you know, up close to uh, past 15%. And the United States is falling down below 20%. And, and we know really well that those lines are going to cross uh, very soon. And China will be a more important uh, part uh, of the world economy uh, than uh, the United States. Um, China has just had uh, its uh, third plenum uh, of the 18th Central Committee uh, with its uh, new leader. Uh, Xi Jinping uh, and the, the, the 60 point uh, decisions of the third plenum, which has just been uh, announced. Uh, people are still trying to dissect exactly what it means and, and what it's going to uh, amount to. Um, but uh, one thing that uh, I, I do think uh, makes most sense to me, and what a lot of people are, are, are saying. Um, is that uh, it's going to mean uh, a much stronger role for the one man in charge, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, than the central group. Uh, they're talking about the emergence of one man authoritarianism, uh, that he thinks the only way he can break the power, the best of interest, and uh, of corruption in the group uh, is if power is concentrated in him alone. Uh, and he can hold uh, others uh, responsible uh, for uh, their failures. Um, and so whether it's going back to a more Mao-like period of one-man rule, uh, I think it's certainly not going back to a cultural revolution or anything like that. I don't get me wrong about that. Um, but it is uh, definitely moving in a, in a new direction, and I don't, uh, the, 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 the general trend I'm not an expert on contemporary China. We can talk about this more later if you want to. Um, but I think what you can see is a move towards the right in the economy, more role for markets, uh, and a move to the left in politics, uh, a stronger power for the party and for the party. Uh, um, but as I say, let me not uh, play pundit on today's news. I want to go back uh, to uh, the historical perspective on this problem uh, that uh, we bring. So if now our question is not why China failed, but how is it that China has become such a powerful and successful uh, economic and political player on the world scene? How are we to understand that? Um, and uh, I would point, uh, on the one hand, to a very important role of the traditional foundations uh, for the growth that is now being experienced. Um, in the imperial period, officials were chosen by examination system, uh, in which they were locked up. Uh, young men were locked up for three days uh, in these examination sheds and chosen largely on the basis of merit uh, for their uh, official position. Whether that worked or not is another question, but it had a powerful impact on Chinese culture in the great respect for education and learning and the belief that the able would get ahead and that one got ahead on the basis of one's own merit. Now, Confucianism, in some respects, failed China in being excessively focused uh, on moral, ethical, and philosophical questions and paying too little attention to technical, scientific, mathematical uh, questions. But in the modern era, when the Confucian stress on education has been combined with a new modern educational system, 
the result is that you've got uh, a Chinese uh, population which puts enormous stress on the education of their children and the younger generation. All one has to do is talk to any Chinese in China today about how much uh, effort and money and time they're putting into the education of their children uh, to understand how important that is uh, and uh, how uh, fundamental that is to creating the cultural, educational, and technical foundation for uh, modernization. The market economy is another thing. And although people often talked about Confucianism disdaining the market, the fact was that China has always had uh, a market uh, economy. Uh, and if you look at slides like this in the classic uh, painting, a small portion of a classic painting, this goes on for uh, yards on either side of what's called the cheating tool. Um, um, and uh, it's, it's simply market scenes, uh, and you can see uh, peasants buying and selling things. Uh, and Chinese have long been traders and long used to the market. All you have to look is look at Southeast Asia uh, and the extent to which the economies of Southeast Asia are dominated by Chinese uh, to realize the Chinese uh, uh, ability in. Uh, commercial uh, activities. Uh, so the basic market and entrepreneurial spirit uh, is alive and well in China traditionally, uh, and it has continued in China today. Uh, one would argue that it was precisely that role of the market that was continued in the pre-revolutionary period uh, in Shanghai and places like that, the port cities, um, and that modern Shanghai uh, is simply a development of uh, the Shanghai of the 1930s uh, and 1940s. But what about the revolution? Uh, are we just to say that the revolution was a great detour? Uh, did Mao lead China on some wayward path of wasting decades in utopian schemes? Uh, was so wrong to advocate revolution to overthrow uh, the Manchu dynasties? Uh, was Sun Yat-sen mistaken that revolution was uh, the way to transform China? Uh, and I realize that these are sensitive political questions. They not only have to do with questions that relate to the legitimacy of the Communist Party, um, but they also have to do with the one view of Mao. Um, for uh, I know that in my field, uh, if, if you say anything uh, at all uh, positive about Mao's revolution, uh, people will say, well, what about the millions of people who died uh, as a result of the, uh, the Great Leap Forward? Um, and Mao is routinely uh, blamed for more deaths than Hitler or Stalin. Uh, he's worse than Hitler or Stalin. So if you're beginning to say that you know there actually was something positive that came out of Mao's revolution, then you end up uh, in a position of, of defending uh, somebody who's worse than Hitler or Stalin. Uh, so th this is not trivial ground uh, that one is treading on uh, when one talks about uh, these issues. Um, but what I would like to suggest is that the revolution did that. Even though the revolutionary narrative uh, may be problematic, uh, there were things that came out of the revolution that we cannot ignore uh, and that are important parts of what China is today. Uh, the problem, for example, with the Shanghai narrative, uh, that you can draw a sort of straight line from the market economy to pre-war Shanghai uh, to present-day Shanghai, uh, is that during World War II, uh, Shanghai was part of the part that uh, was occupied by the Japanese. Um, and if you're going to have a line from the Shanghai culture of the 1930s, uh, it's really going to be a line that's going to lead into the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere uh, with China, a part of uh, the Japanese uh, larger empire. The revolution came not out of Shanghai. Uh, the revolution came 
when Mao was in the countryside uh, with the peasants fighting the Japanese. Shanghai was never particularly anti-Japanese. Shanghai was never particularly pa patriotic. Uh, but uh, the interior uh, was. Uh, and the interior was dedicated to uh, a nationalist uh, revolution. If we are going to understand the nationalism of China today, we must understand that nationalism as coming out of the struggle against Japan uh, and the struggle against imperialism, uh, led not just by the communists, <coughs> just the led by Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists as well. Um, but it was out of that revolution that Mao could proclaim uh, that the Chinese people have uh, stood up. It is out of that revolution and that uh, quest for national glory that China dedicated itself to developing uh, its own uh, atomic bomb. Uh, and it's a continuation of that nationalism that leads China today uh, to insist that all of this area down in here is Chinese uh, uh, inherent uh, territory. one to one. Uh, 
uh, women are going to higher education at the same rate as males. It wasn't anything like that when I first went to China in, in, in 1980. It was probably about uh, four to one uh, males. Uh, but uh, women are, are now uh, being educated. All of the studies that you see of economic development across the world, and all of the studies, for example, of why the Islamic world is having such difficulty uh, in moving ahead, have to do with women's education. Uh, and with women's education comes women's employment, comes women's rights, comes women's insistence uh, on an equal, more equal role in their families and one thing or another. Those things came out of the revolution. Mao Zedong famously talked about uh, women holding up half the sky. He didn't carry it out. Uh, if we look back at the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, that was seven men up there. that in any sense uh, you know, uh, China has achieved uh, gender equality. Nothing like it, especially in the political sphere. But uh, you have women in education, you have women in jobs, you have women entrepreneurs, and it's a very important part uh, of the uh, growth that we see today. Um, the state investment in infrastructure, uh, in roads, uh, in highways, uh, in railroads, in telecommunications, in science and technology, in higher education. Um, the, the number of people that are getting higher education today uh, is, is 10 times uh, what it was uh, just 15 uh, or 20 years uh, ago. Uh, so all of those things uh, are coming uh, out of the, the transformation uh, that are much uh, the transformation of the revolution uh, as of so to conclude, uh, uh, Zorro uh, had told us that revolution is inevitable uh, if China is to take its place as a powerful nation on the globe. But I would say, as a historian, that I don't think inevitable is provable. Um, I don't think you could ever say that it's inevitable that revolution was necessary. Uh, to the process of uh, China's emergence today. Um, but I would say that it was important. Uh, the tradition of culture, uh, the value placed on education, uh, the long familiarity with the market economy, uh, they were important. Uh, but the greatest error uh, of the popular press and common uh, understanding is that the revolution was all negative, that the revolution did nothing, uh, that China only uh, progressed uh, after uh, Mao's uh, death. And even greater is the association of that growth only with joining the WTO or learning to be more like us, and therefore the image that somehow there's going to be a grand convergence in which we're all going to become like each other uh, and uh, China is going to become uh, just like uh, the United States. Uh, some time ago, um, I saw this wonderful uh, painting. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it uh, uh, before. Uh, it's a reproduction uh, of, uh, of Dante's uh, Inferno. Um, but, and actually, I, I had to cut it off to make it that there's more of those on, on, on both sides here. Um, and uh, one of the things uh, I would note about it is that uh, I would be willing to bet uh, that the Chinese in the audience today can recognize a lot more of the Westerners than the Westerners will recognize of the Chinese. Um, and it's part of a much more global education and awareness uh, of uh, the wider world uh, which characterizes China today. Um, and uh, this is, of course, by a Chinese uh, artist. Um, and you know, there's now, of course, right next to Lincoln. Um, there's Marx uh, there, uh, right next to Nietzsche. Uh, Stalin is next to Leonardo. 
Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, my favorite one uh, is up here. You may recognize uh, our, our previous president, uh, George W. Bush. And you can see he's looking through a telescope in this way, and he's behind him. Uh, he's looking the wrong direction for Bin Laden. Uh, but uh, in any case, it's not all to do with China, but it does, does try to uh, suggest in some way uh, that, that we live uh, in a world of many cultures and many people and many heroes uh, and many paths, uh, and only if we understand them all, uh, are tolerant, uh, are perceptive, uh, and inquisitive uh, of all of them, will we understand both the world that China is moving towards and the world that we're moving towards. Thank you.